My name is Betty Silberman. On behalf of the Jewish Federation of Sarasota Manatee, we thank you for joining us today. I am honored to be your host for today's commemoration, which every year is on January 27th and is declared by the United Nations as International Holocaust Remembrance Day. Today, the United Nations urges us to honor the memory of Holocaust victims. They concur that developing educational programs about Holocaust history can help prevent future acts of genocide by applying the lessons of the Holocaust to today's world. They encourage us on this day to reassert our commitment to human rights, re-remember those who perished during the Holocaust, and honor those who bore witness and survived this horrific period in our history. We pay tribute to those righteous individuals, both Jew and non-Jew, who exhibited inspirational human traits and at great risk to themselves and their families to save, rescue, and liberate them. We acknowledge all the family members and loved ones who have also carried the pain. Let us honor their legacy, and together, let us vow to fight the resurgence and overt expressions of anti-Semitism racism, and hatred, which we are witnessing. By educating our children and our community, we strive to make our world a safer and better place for us all, today and for generations to come. Our Jewish Federation of Sarasota Manatee has a long-standing commitment to Holocaust education, offering a broad spectrum of special events, lectures, and programming to help create a world without prejudice and hate. In addition to our unwavering support of Holocaust education initiatives, the mission of the Jewish Federation is to strengthen Jewish life and identity in our community, to provide for Jewish people in need, and promote support for Israel. We fulfill our mission by supporting programs and projects that care for the vulnerable in Sarasota Manatee, in Israel and around the world. And now, a few words about today's program. Our theme for today is bearing witness and being an upstander. A precise definition states that to bear witness means to testify to an event. But it is said that bearing witness to the Holocaust should mean even more than that. It should also mean recognizing and remembering the lessons of history. An upstander is a person who speaks or acts in support of an individual or cause, particularly someone who intervenes on behalf of a person who is being attacked or bullied. Recognizing and remembering the lessons of history and applying them to today's world, standing up and intervening on behalf of a person being attacked or bullied, is, very, is the very embodiment and intention of today's International Holocaust Remembrance Day commemoration. We begin our program with a Sarasota Jewish chorale who will sing the American and Israeli national anthems, followed by an invocation by Associate Rabbi Michael Shifrin from Temple Emmanuel. Rabbi Shifrin currently serves as president of the Sarasota Manatee Rabbinical Association.
that you're here. It's good that you're here. It's right that you're here. I wish we weren't here, but we need to be. We are here to bear witness, each of us. Each of us are here to remember, to know, to learn, to connect, to be inspired, and to feel pain. Each one of us has an obligation and a responsibility to work towards what is right and what is good. That means being an upstander. And by your being here tonight, you are taking an action towards standing up. We come together this evening for many reasons. To mourn those whose lives were taken from us during the Holocaust. Those souls, so many of whom were taken because of how they identified what they were known as. They weren't known as someone's best friend, and they should have been. Holy souls who had a place in this world that was taken. We also come here to honor those who survived, those who made it through the most unspeakable horrors that one could imagine. Those who survived that speak out loud and tell their stories who are, are great teachers. And those who survived where the pain and the memories are too painful to even speak of. We stand with them too. We think of our local survivors here in the Sarasota Manatee area we cherish and adore and want to look after, who carry with them a special spark of the divine to each day of their lives. We honor and come together to appreciate the friends and families who make this remembering, this commemorating, a centerpiece of their lives. And we also think today of those who saved. Those who saved souls, those who housed, those who gave, those who carried on their shoulders, often at the expense of their own lives and livelihood, to keep one soul alive. In Jewish tradition, Saving one soul is taught to be the equivalent of saving an entire universe. Those who saved people are worthy of our acknowledgement as well. It's hard to know how to say the right words on this solemn occasion. When we think about children we think about the elderly, we think about siblings, the unknown heroes, the fighters, the victims, the rescuers, the liberators. And our hearts are heavy. It's hard to know what to say when thinking about the horrors of history, but we must say something because we cannot allow genocide to occur. We cannot allow the senseless killing of innocent lives and souls. We cannot remain silent towards prejudice in our world. It is our job to bring light to the darkness. It is our job to bear witness and sit in that discomfort. And it is our job to find the courage to stand up 
and be an upstander. I offer a prayer. In Jewish tradition, we might say, Ribono Shel Olam, the master of the universe. On this solemn occasion, we open our hearts and minds and souls to you, God, to remember the six million, to remember the 11 million, to remember indifference and suffering and evil. We ask you, God, to help us honor the heroes and the martyrs, the victims and the survivors. We ask that you calm our souls and make vibrant our memories, that you grant us courage and an open ear to our prayers. As we commemorate what happened not that long ago, be gentle with us, O oh God. Help us remember. Strengthen our will to ensure that a monstrosity like this never occurs again. Please, God, hear our prayer. Remove evil from our midst. Bring freedom. Bring justice. Bring eternal comfort to all the souls. Honor their lives and memory and help us do that with our work today. And please, God, let us all know shalom. Let us all know peace and wholeness. King Yehiratzon, may it be God's will. We now have the distinct pleasure of hearing from Shep Englander, the CEO of the Jewish Federation of Sarasota Manatee, who will share a few words. Thank you, Betty, and thank you to everyone who's with us today. We know that if we don't learn the lessons of history, we are doomed to repeat them. Most of my father's family was wiped out at Auschwitz, so I know how horrible those lessons are and how urgent it is that we never forget them. And sadly, with the attack on the synagogue in Coleyville, Texas, just last week, we know that we have much work to do because anti-Semitism is not a distant memory. It is very much with us, and so is the threat of violence. That's why I'm so proud that our Federation has an excellent Holocaust education program and a deep commitment to bringing it to the schools and the civic community at every opportunity and in every way. We all must deepen our commitment to fight anti-Semitism, hate, and to create a world where everyone is safe and secure so that we can all thrive and build the societies that we deserve. Let us now hear from Dr. Anna Cohen, the founding and current chair for our International Holocaust Remembrance Day commemoration. Dr. Anna Cohen is deeply committed to ensuring that we will always remember those who bore witness, and especially those who stood up to save Jews during the Holocaust. Dr. Cohen will be followed by Cantor Rizel Bain, who will offer us a magnificent musical piece. Six million Jewish people perished during the Holocaust. One and a half million of them were children. Relatively, few of those who bore witness to and experienced the atrocities of the Holocaust survived to tell their stories. Every day, I have the privilege of speaking with and being inspired by my husband, who survived the Holocaust as a young child in Poland. His story is a critical lesson in history, not only in his story, the one of survival, but one of the courage, resilience, endurance, and hope. We owe a debt of gratitude to all these courageous survivors who bore witness, who shared their stories, and it taught us the true lessons of the Holocaust. We are for 
ever grateful to our local area survivors who continue to share their stories with us and with school children. Indeed, their words compel us to always remember, hopefully the words never again will remain a reality for the future of generations to come. Today, we also remember the many Jews who during World War II resisted the Nazis to help the Jews, and we honor those brave soldiers under the command of Dwight David Eisenhower who liberated the concentration death camps and who captured images of, of the aftermath of the Nazi terror in film, in photos for all to see. We also pay tribute to those non-Jews, despite the risk to themselves and their families, they choose not to stand by to watch the atrocities of the Holocaust happen, but they stood up to help, save, hide, and rescue Jews during the Holocaust. Famed Holocaust survivor and educator Ellie Wiesel once said, we know these good people who helped Jews during the Holocaust. We must learn from them and in gratitude, we must remember and honor them. Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Authority in Israel, as of January 2021, has recognized 27,921 of those brave upstanders hailing from 51 different countries as righteous among the nations. I would not be here today delivering this speech if it were not for the Albanians from a small Muslim village who sheltered my Greek Jewish parents in Albania. I would like to pay a personal tribute to the Lazai family and to the people all over the world who risk their life to save the Jews. Their courage was stronger than fear. The stories of those who bore witness and those who are upstanders teach us to never be a bystander and with all our free will to always stand up to resist all forms of expression of hatred, racism, and anti-Semitism. The stories teach us to help create a world of equality, justice, and dignity for all, and through their love, how to be better citizens of the world. I will be chanting the 23rd Psalm for the six million souls we lost.
It is my very great pleasure now to introduce our keynote speaker, Susan Eisenhower. Ms. Eisenhower is a consultant and author, and well known for her work as a policy analyst, much of which has been focused on national security and related strategic issues. Ms. Eisenhower is also the daughter of John Eisenhower and granddaughter of the President Dwight Eisenhower. Her latest book, How Ike Led, examines the principles behind some of Eisenhower's biggest decisions from World War II to the early years of the Cold War. In her book, we learn about the extraordinary heroism of her grandfather. He led American soldiers to defeat Nazi Germany in Europe and in 1945 had the vision to preserve the truth of the Holocaust because he so rightly foresaw that there might be a day when the horrors of the Holocaust would be denied. How Ike Led teaches us about the man and what lessons we can still learn from, from him today. Now let's learn from Susan Eisenhower. Hello, my name is Susan Eisenhower. What a pleasure uh, it is to be with you uh, to mark this important International Holocaust Remembrance Day. I'd like to say a special thank you too to uh, Betty Zaret and Dr. Bernadette uh, Bennett, who have been uh, so helpful in bringing about um, my appearance here this evening. Um, I must say that um, in thinking about this uh, subject of bearing witness, um, uh, it's a powerful theme, and the theme um, is something that means a great deal to me. Uh, I have to say that the story of the Holocaust is something that has uh, deeply shaped my own thinking uh, and has uh, been uh, a subject that's come up many, many times in my life. Uh, I was honored to um, accept an award on behalf of my family at the National Holocaust Museum, uh, and I have regularly visited uh, the events there. It was one evening during that time, um, 
when someone gave a really powerful speech about the Holocaust and Dwight Eisenhower's uh, role in it, that uh, during the break, I went out into the hallway and I thought, you know, I never thought of it this way, I said to myself. Um, Dwight Eisenhower uh, made a decision right there on the spot uh, to make sure that the chronicle um, of these horrific events would be available for future generations. Uh, and I'll say more about that in a few minutes. But what deeply moved me at that particular moment, especially as I've spent much of my life trying to figure out uh, sort of what made uh, my grandfather tick, I thought to myself, you know, this was really outside of his job description. He really didn't have to stop and say, no one will believe this uh, 50 years from now. And while he didn't actually say it out loud, he certainly sent that message back to Chief of Staff of the Army, uh, General George Marshall. In any case, as I was standing uh, uh, in the break, <clears throat> uh, in between uh, speeches at the Holocaust Museum, I thought to myself, he didn't have to do that. It was not, as I said, in his job description. Uh, and then I thought, well, what he was really doing perhaps was uttering some truth from the position of power that he um, was responsible for uh, during World War II. Imagine that, um, actually using his position of power to tell a truth uh, that would last, he hoped, through the ages. Uh, this to me was particularly moving because I was very well aware of the German American roots uh, that were part of my um, family history. Uh, Dwight Eisenhower's parents, both his mother and his father, were part of a, a um, German community. And as a matter of fact, uh, the Eisenhowers, just before uh, Dwight Eisenhower's generation, uh, spoke German at home. Uh, so imagine taking this position as he saw the horrors of the Holocaust unfold, that he didn't care about his ethnic roots. Uh, he was an American, and what happened there was so horrific that it had to be chronicled for all time. And so uh, I think part of this came out of something I knew well about him uh, that I try to uh, underscore uh, in my own book, How I Cled, that um, inspiration, you might say, at the Holocaust Museum led me to want to tell a story about how he thought about things, what was important to him. And this was a set of principles uh, that it didn't matter whether it was your friends, your relatives, uh, your colleagues, uh, they would be held accountable for things they did that were unacceptable, not only um, to those who were uh, working hard to make the world a better place, but also to the international community. Um, and I think that this is exemplified um, by a kind of inborn empathy he had. Now, I remember many times at the family dinner table, he would say something like, uh, well, how do you think it looks to the other guy? And a number of his colleagues who I knew in their later years told me often that President Eisenhower would say that at cabinet meetings. This is a kind of discipline. Uh, it's, it's not just emotional empathy, but it is what is often called in leadership terms, strategic empathy. That is seeing the world through the eyes of somebody else. And the reason it's important uh, can be both um, sympathetic, but it can also be um, cold-headedly uh, analytical. Uh, think about this, for instance. The invasion of Normandy on June 6, 1944, depended on one, uh, one important fact, and that is that the Allies had assessed uh, the Germans' own preconceived ideas. And they understood that the Germans were uh, thinking that uh, Allied forces were going to cross the English Channel at Calais. Uh, precisely because of that analysis, putting yourself in the minds of uh, your German enemy uh, would be a way to understand that to outfox him, you would have to do something he wasn't expecting. And for largely that reason, uh, our forces came in uh, in Normandy. 
which was a much more difficult crossing, and uh, it took a much longer period of time to cross that English Channel. In any case, we deceived the Germans in many other ways, too, by uh, establishing encampments uh, on the coast of England that looked from the air like they were full-blown uh, armored divisions, when in fact they were only uh, uh, tanks and other equipment uh, that were uh, blown up like balloons uh, to sit on the shoreline to fool our enemy. And so this kind of strategic empathy uh, was part of it. But I have to say, and I hope I demonstrated this uh, in my book, How I Led, Ike really had uh, deeply religious uh, views. I would say they were spiritual views. He was more inclined towards um, the privacy of his own religion than he was uh, towards making a show of it. Um, but he believed in the dignity of man and the rights of man. And he felt connections to people because he was interested in them. And this comes out to me so strongly as I did research about the Holocaust. Uh, the way he connected immediately with the suffering of the people he saw when he went to Ordruf on April 12th, uh, 1945. Now, let me just take you to that uh, event. Ordruf uh, was a concentration camp, or I should say it was a uh, forced labor camp, that became um, uh, a terrible uh, 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 actually, death camp in the end. Um, it was a subcamp of Buchenwald. And uh, on April 12th, uh, Eisenhower, uh, General Bradley, and uh, General Patton visited Patton's headquarters. Uh, we were within the last weeks of the war. Um, and first in the morning, uh, they went to um, uh, Merkers, a, um, a mine uh, not far from. Uh, Patton's headquarters, and there they um, ascended into this mine that contained uh, extraordinary things. It turned out that uh, Nazi Germany's last gold reserves uh, were being hidden in that mine, along with uh, jewelry um, and many other pieces of artwork stolen from uh, the Jewish people and from art museums all over Europe. That was already um, a stunning discovery. Uh, General Eisenhower had uh, heard about this mine, but actually to see it for himself uh, really underscored um, th this attitude on the on the enemy's part uh, to you know engage in wholesale theft across Europe. Then in the afternoon, um, he went to uh, Ordruf with uh, Bradley and Patton, um, and there apparently driving into uh, the area. Uh, the smell of death was so overwhelming that uh, even General Patton wasn't sure he was going to be able to get out of the car and uh, visit the facility. Um, but uh, I will say that uh, Dwight Eisenhower was a very determined man. Uh, and he, as he reported later in his memoirs, he made it a point to see, quote, every nook and cranny um, so that he could bear witness to what was already a horrific scene. So horrific. Uh, he said that in his later years, he said that literally the English language did not have words that could describe how he felt. Well, so that evening he got back to Patton's headquarters. Uh, it's interesting that that evening they also got news that uh, President Franklin Roosevelt had just died. Uh, but despite that tragedy, Eisenhower was still so stunned by what he saw that day that he wrote, uh, General Marshall a note. Um, he said that um, of his trip that day, by far and away the most horrible was, quote, a sight that I encountered during the trip, um, a visit to a German internment camp near Gotha. The things I saw beggar description. While I was touring the camp, I encountered three men uh, who had been inmates and by one ruse or another had made their escape. I interviewed them through an interpreter. The visual evidence and the verbal testimony of starvation, cruelty, and bestiality were so overpowering as to leave me a bit sick. In one room where they uh, were piled up, 20 and 30 naked men killed by starvation, George Patton would not even enter. He said he would get sick if he did so. I made the visit deliberately in order to be in a position to give firsthand evidence 
of these things if ever in the future there develops a tendency to charge these allegations merely to propaganda. Uh, not long after that, Eisenhower requested that Marshall send members of Congress, uh, members of um, the uh, journalism community, um, and he ordered anyone, um, any military personnel uh, near the discovery of these camps uh, were ordered to go in and take um, their cameras um, to also provide visual evidence of what had happened. He was also intent on keeping the German people accountable. And after the horrific discovery of Ordruf, he sent the mayor uh, of Gotha and his wife and the community in to see what had happened uh, at this camp nearby. Um, without trying to interpret uh, what led to the next uh, event, I can only say that the mayor of Gotha and his wife that evening committed suicide. In any case, the order stood. Eisenhower made sure uh, the German villages went in to see what had been going on at these camps nearby. And as I said, um, active duty officers um, and enlisted men were um, asked to go to these camps to photograph what they saw. Uh, in that context, I can tell you that my father uh, was uh, a recent graduate from West Point and was with his unit somewhere near Buchenwald. Um, and during that time, in the last weeks of the war, my father visited Buchenwald and took uh, four or five pages of what turned out to be uh, a photo album of these pictures to show you how um, intent my father was on making sure we knew about this. I was literally raised on those pictures, as horrific as they were. As a matter of fact, I think even as a child, I couldn't stop thinking about it. And sometimes I dreamed about it. Uh, but my father wanted to make sure that we understood what people were capable of uh, when they were power hungry, desperate, and when they objectified other people. Um, nobody could have imagined until that moment that this could be that bad. I also have to say that my father, who passed away in 2013, uh, made sure that not only his children um, saw these pictures, but so did. Um, my children and also my grandchildren um, saw these pictures and they become, they are a very important part of our own family biography. So um, I just want to kind of close this idea by saying again that uh, Eisenhower had um, been present. He had seen what had occurred. He decided on the spot to bear witness. Um, and he did so despite the fact that he was angry. He was angry in ways that no one had ever seen him angry before. Angry, no doubt, that maybe his um, uh, familial um, ancestors uh, were capable of such a thing. But he was later quoted as saying, when I, first, when I found the first camp, I think I was never so angry in my life. The bestiality displayed there was not merely piled up bodies of people who'd starved to death, but to follow down the road to see where they tried to evacuate them so that they could still work. Uh, you could see where they sprawled on the road. You can even go to their burial pits and see horrors that really I wouldn't even want to begin to describe. I think people ought to know about such things. It explains something of my attitude towards the German war criminal. I believe he must be punished. And I will hold out on that forever. Well, in conclusion, I have to say that this story is very close to my heart. It was the inspiration for my writing, How I Led the Principles Behind Eisenhower's Biggest Decision. And I have to say that I wanted to tell this story because it's an excellent example of not only bearing witness, but also in thinking what is known as thinking in time. That is the capacity to see something and to say to yourself, how will this look in 50 years? I think it's moving indeed that uh, actually uh, when Eisenhower became uh, head of uh, the Allied um, Occupation Force, uh, he said to his staffers that we will know that we will have been successful in this war 
if 50 years from now, the German people have a prosperous modern democracy? Well, uh, Eisenhower's vision was largely fulfilled on both sides, but that uh, accountability uh, for the German public would not have been possible uh, without, his, uh, without his insight, without his determination, and without his willingness to bear witness, even though there were no requirements on his part to do so. So let me just say uh, again, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you this evening. Uh, let me also say that this is a story that must be passed on to future generations because the human mind uh, has a hard time imagining things that seem so far from our current experience. But as we know from World War II, what seemed like civilized countries, uh, countries that uh, many Americans were associated with, would soon descend into a kind of hell. Um, and it's because of the many people who helped my grandfather chronicle the Holocaust, that today we have still a largely peaceful world. Thank you very much for this opportunity, and I wish you all the very best on this important Remembrance Day. Thank you, Ms. Eisenhower. Dr. Stephen Covert, principal of Pineview School, will share the story of his great uncle, who was one of those liberators who bore witness to the atrocities of the Holocaust. Hello. My name is Dr. Stephen Covert, and I have the honor and privilege of serving the students and community at Pineview School in Sarasota, Florida as principal. I'm also honored to have supported Pineview School's participation in this year's Daffodil Project in partnership with the Jewish Federation of Sarasota. Ms. Zaret and I worked with several others from the Federation and Pineview School teachers and students on bringing this special project to help everyone remember the Holocaust and the lives of the children specifically lost in World War II. In speaking with Ms. Zaret, I shared with her that my great uncle served in World War II and helped to liberate one of the camps. And she asked if I would share his story with the Jewish Federation and it is for that purpose that I come to you now. My great uncle was Hilton Wolf, and he was born in 1917 in West Virginia. He grew up throughout the depression and then in 1940 enlisted in the army. He eventually became a machine gunner with the 101st Airborne Division and jumped with the Screaming Eagles on D-Day into Normandy. He fought in battles you may have heard of like St. Mary Glees, Noville, Battle of Carentan, St. Marie Dumont, Operation Market Garden, and the Battle of Eindhoven, the famous Battle of the Bulge and the defense of Bastogne, the liberation of the concentration camps, and the eventual capture of Hitler's last stronghold in Bavaria, known as the Eagle's Nest. He eventually went on to serve in Korea, and he lived until 2001. He earned the Purple Heart, the Presidential Unit Citation, a Bronze Star, and earned his jump wings with five combat jumps and his glider wings as well. The flag which draped his coffin when he passed away is in my office, as well as a shadow box with his medals and a picture of him to remind me of his sacrifice and the sacrifice of so many others. There are many great books about World War II and the 101st Airborne and the Holocaust as well. One of them is Silent Wings at War by John Loden. And there's a passage about and from my great uncle that I'd like to share with you. It's from 100, page 123. Private First Class Hilton Wolf of the 101st Airborne was in an American field hospital near the village of Mormelon, 50 miles outside Paris, with an injured back. He could walk, but was in a great deal of pain. A doctor asked him if he wanted to rejoin his unit, and Private First Class Hilton Wolf said, It was December 17, 1944. I'd been listening to the radio and knew how bad it was at the Ardennes battle. I told the doctor I was all right and wanted to join my outfit. We had come off the line in Holland on November 27th, just three weeks before, and I could not have lived with myself if I hadn't gone to Bastogne to help. We hightailed it for Bastogne by truck, 
leaving at 2 p.m. or thereabouts on December 17th and arrived at 4 a.m. the morning of the 18th. The ride wasn't as comfortable as my previous journey into battle in the Operation Market Garden. I flew into Holland in a CG4A glider. Somewhere over the North Sea, I fell asleep and dreamed that I was a kid again and back on my grandmother's farm near Given, West Virginia. All of a sudden, it was the 4th of July. I was hearing the boom of sky rockets, the sharp bang of cherry bombs, and the snapping of firecrackers. I woke up with a start to realize I was over the glider's landing zone and we were taking heavy enemy fire. The glider pilot did a great job of getting us down. A guy had to be crazy to fly one of those damn things, and we all scattered for cover through a barrage of enemy mortar fire when we landed. Above us, I saw tow planes on fire and gliders spinning in or disintegrating in the air. It was brutal. By contrast, when we arrived at Bastogne at four in the morning, there were no sounds of war. I could hear a bunch of farm dogs yapping it up in the distance even. It was extremely cold uh, when they arrived in Bastogne, and my great uncle always said that he never really warmed up after that winter in Bastogne. As I mentioned, the 101st, among other Allied divisions, they were instrumental in discovering and liberating the concentration camps in the Holocaust. My great uncle was involved in liberating Kaufering Camp 4, which was part of the Dachau concentration camp network. The 12th Armored Division reached Kaufering Camp 4 on 27 April 1944, with the 101st Airborne Division arriving the very next day. What the soldiers encountered was absolutely the most horrible of horrible atrocities. The paratroopers found close to a thousand corpses, as well as Jewish victims who were still alive and could be saved. The Nazis had tried to burn the concentration camp with its inhabitants in it to the ground because they knew the Americans were coming and wanted to hide any evidence of their horrible atrocities. Many of the structures survived. They were indescribably filthy, and the conditions were truly inhuman. One of the liberators, and I'll preface by saying this is a graphic uh, representation and portrayal of what the soldier saw, so I apologize in advance. One of the soldiers in my great uncle's unit is reported to have said, our first sight of the camp was appalling. Inside the enclosure, we could see three rows of bodies, approximately two or 300. We entered the camp to look at and find survivors. The bodies were in all shapes and conditions. Some were half burned, others badly scorched. Their fists were clenched in the agonies of death. Their eyes were bulging and dilated as though even in death, they were seeing and enduring the horrors of their lives in prison at the hands of the Nazis. None were more than skin and bones. The camp had been partially destroyed by fire, and these were the victims. Seeing these atrocities and living through these experiences profoundly changed many of the paratroopers. So many of those images, they say, were indelibly etched in their memories forever. International Holocaust Mem Remembrance Day is so important as many of the liberators as well as the survivors of the Holocaust are aging and passing away. And if we don't tell their stories, fight against anti-Semitism and fascism in all its forms of hatred, history can very well repeat itself. So every one of us can do our part to tell the stories of those who were there, of those who survived, of those who fought against hatred and fascism and anti-Semitism, and honor the lives of the six million Jews who were murdered in the Holocaust. 
I am proud that my great uncle and so many others were able to do their part to make a difference in World War II. And now it is up to us to carry that message on. Hashtag we remember. Thank you. We will now be joined by the incomparable Kate Alexander from Florida Studio Theater, who will help us pay tribute to an extraordinary woman, Dr. Helen Fagan, who dedicated her life to bearing witness and being an upstander. The pleasures of heaven are with me, and the pains of hell are with me. The first I graft and increase upon myself, the latter I translate into a new tongue. These beloved words by Walt Whitman describe the extraordinary life of Dr. Helen N. Fagan. Helen Fagan, overcoming great personal tragedy, has triumphed, spending a lifetime dedicated to teaching the lessons of the Holocaust. Born in Radomsko, Poland in 1918, Helen grew up in the darkness of the Holocaust, yet emerged as a shining light in the fight against anti-Semitism and hatred in all its many forms. Growing up, Helen lived with her family in an apartment above the small town department store owned and operated by her father. She was in her second year at the University of Krakow when the war began on September 2nd, 1939. One day after the German invasion of Poland, Helen's life was shattered by a German bomb that demolished her home. After the bombing, all they could find in the rubble was a twisted piano string, a burnt silver spoon, and a charred piece of wall covering. At the age of 21, Helen and her family were rounded up with all of the Jews in Radomsko and forced into a ghetto. Tragically, her parents were taken to the extermination camp at Treblinka, where, along with so many others, they perished. The day after her parents were taken, Helen received a small package in which she found her father's silver cigarette case and her mother's golden locket. Inside was a note that read, Sorry, children, that this is happening to us. Please, try to stay together. We love you very much. Your mommy and daddy, she says. These were our parents' last words to us. In the ghetto, Helen ran a secret school for Jewish children. She said, can you imagine a world without access to reading, to learning, to books? With great courage and empathy, Helen would read smuggled books, such as Gone with the Wind, would help the suffering children soften their pain by providing them with a journey into another world. One day, she received word from the underground that the ghetto was going to be liquidated. She said, the Nazis were coming for the rest of us. Knowing full well there was no chance for me to survive, I decided for better or worse, I'm running. She ran into a building and hid in the attic, evading the Nazis who were searching for Jews. She says, the Nazis did not find me, and I came out of the attic after eight days. A young man from the underground came back and took me to Warsaw. I had to make a new identity for myself. I had to live under false papers. Helen was finally reunited with her sisters after a time, and they were liberated by the Russian army. Eventually, after the war, Helen and her sisters made their way to a displaced persons camp for survivors in Austria. From there, in 1946, they made their way to America, to New York. Two years later, in 1948, Helen married Sidney Fagan, and together they moved to Miami. Sidney became a building contractor who, upon retirement, earned fame as a sculptor. The two were married for 68 years and had two children, Judith and Gary. Since her university studies were interrupted by the war, Helen pursued her education when her children were older. She earned her bachelor's and master's degrees in English from the University of Miami and finally her doctorate while teaching full time. She, like so many others, did not speak about the Holocaust. 
And then there was an auspicious encounter that would forever change her life's purpose. She met Ellie Wiesel, Holocaust survivor, author, and educator. Helen asked him if he, like her, had Holocaust nightmares. She said, he looked straight into my eyes and said, if you and I who are survivors don't speak about it and teach it, then other people will approach it using their own imaginations. I knew at that moment, this was my calling. The journey of her calling began. Initially, the idea of being involved in Holocaust education was too painful for her. But eventually, she developed a curriculum for a course on Holocaust literature, one of the earliest of its kind in the nation. More than encouraging students to simply analyze and critique writers' works, Helen concentrated on teaching a moral lesson. She said, I became strongly convinced that the Holocaust could serve as a constructive lesson in teaching personal morality to young men and women. It is here that she began to teach the idea that humanity needed a deep moral compass. The fact that she herself was a survivor made these lessons of the moral compass more poignant and impactful. In 1979, Helen was invited to serve as an education advisor to Elie Wiesel and later was appointed chair of the United States Holocaust Council's Education Committee. The committee was in charge of developing an educational track for the future of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. The museum opened in 1993. Speaking that day was President Bill Clinton, Eli Wiesel, and Israel's President Chaim Herzog. Later, President Clinton asked Helen to serve on the advisory board for the World War II Memorial in Washington, D.C. Helen has continued for the rest of her life to have a profound influence on Holocaust education through the collaborative creation of many institutions, memorials, and educational programming. In addition to receiving a multitude of awards, at the age of 103, Helen was awarded both the key to the city of Sarasota and the prestigious Jewish Federation of Sarasota Manatees Zachor Eisenhower Award for bearing witness to the Holocaust. It was her daughter, Judith, who created a Legacy of Light Endowment Fund for the Holocaust Education at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in her mother's name. Helen wrote, We, the surviving victims of the Holocaust, bequeath to you our legacy, born of suffering, pain, and dehumanization, and the loss of our loved ones, in hopes that from the depth of this darkness, a new light will emerge in your world, a light of hope, of peace, of tolerance, and of understanding. This gives meaning to my survival. Helen's story is one of survival, resilience, strength, and determination to stand up against the anti-Semitism that had destroyed everything she held dear. And so we say to you, dearest, Helen, child of the Holocaust, profound soul, great educator, yours is a life well lived. And as you stood up for so many, we now stand up for you in our actions, our words, our deeds, and our moral compass that will carry your legacy far, far into the future. Helen, we love you and we thank you. Let us now rejoice in this beautiful performance of the prayer as sung by Derek Brookins and Emma Katz.
Greetings. My name is Kyle Scott Batty, Vice Mayor of the great city of Sarasota. On this annual day of commemoration, I urge the community to honor the six million Jewish victims of the Holocaust and the millions of other victims of Nazism. We honor the memories of the precious lives lost, mourn the communities broken and scattered, and embrace those who survived the Holocaust, some of whom are still with us today continuing to embody extraordinary resilience through all of these years. I am honored to read the following proclamation on behalf of my fellow commissioners. Whereas International Holocaust Remembrance Day is a time for us to remember that six million Jews, including one and a half million children, died in the Nazi Holocaust as part of a systemic program of genocide, and millions of others also perished as victims of Nazism. And whereas to ensure that these unimaginable horrors are never repeated, it is our duty to educate future generations on these horrific lessons of the past and to help develop a deeper understanding of the moral responsibilities of individuals, societies, and governments. And whereas, as we contemplate this year's International Holocaust Remembrance Day, we should preserve this shared history of anguish to keep it vivid and real so that racism, anti-Semitism, hatred, persecution, and prejudice can be combated, contained, and eradicated from our communities. And whereas we as a community recognize the Jewish Federation of Sarasota Manatees Holocaust Education and Programming Initiative for raising awareness of the Holocaust and for advocating for Holocaust and genocide education in our schools and in our communities. Now, Therefore, the City Commission of the City of Sarasota, Florida, and on behalf of the citizens of our community, take great pride in recognizing January 27, 2022, as International Holocaust Remembrance Day, a day of special importance and worthy of the recognition of the citizens of Sarasota. Hello, my name is Andrew Warren, and it is my privilege and honor to serve as the State Attorney for Hillsborough County. Thank you for the invitation to talk about anti-Semitism for Yom HaShoah. I'm going to talk this evening, not through my experience as a prosecutor, but as a Jewish American, a citizen, a father, and an elected official. It was 35 years ago, but I can still vividly remember going to high holiday services in Gainesville to show up to see swastikas painted on the outside of the synagogue. I can still feel that fear and uncertainty. It was a similar experience just a couple of years afterwards when I was stopped at a turnpike in Florida with my dad to get a bite to eat. And standing in line next to us was a neo-Nazi in full attire. I remember thinking, worrying, could he tell that we were Jewish? What would he do? Could my dad protect me? After high school, I attended a trip in Poland to visit concentration camps. And those same feelings resurfaced when we were entering a Jewish cemetery and there was a group of skinheads shouting obscenities at us. I still remember the camps, where I stood, how I felt, why I cried. Barracks filled to the rafters with the shoes of murdered children. The smell of charred bodies that still poison the air. For the past 25 years, I've kept a rock on my desk that I took from the death camp of Birkenau as a reminder that I chose to walk in and unlike six million of my ancestors, had the luxury and freedom to walk out. Years later, these feelings have resurfaced in parenthood. My 10-year-old's been learning about the Holocaust, and she asks me, does anti-Semitism still exist? And I have that same feeling that so many parents have when they have to admit to their children that yes, it does. Inevitably, she asks, can the Holocaust happen again, and do we need to be scared? And I tell her that we don't need to be scared because it won't happen again. This is a different time with different people in a different government, and it won't happen again because we won't let it happen again. And she accepts that answer and breathes a sigh of relief. But she doesn't know enough to point out that the same could have been said of European Judaism before the rise of Nazism. She doesn't know enough to point out the rising tide of anti-Semitism throughout our country and the world. She doesn't know that we are here talking about anti-Semitism in 2022, precisely because that concern still exists. But we know better. The Holocaust didn't happen overnight. 
the possibility existed because the cancer of anti-Semitism had lingered and spread throughout history, exploited by evil men and condoned by the silent masses. So here we are again. This is not just a critical issue at this moment. This is a critical issue at every moment. As it's been said, anti-Semitism is the godfather of racism and the gateway to tyranny, fascism, and war. Anti-Semitism should be considered not as the enemy of the Jewish people, but as the common enemy of humanity and of civilization. During the Yiskor service on Yom Kippur, we ask God to remember the souls of martyred Jews, the innocent men, women, and children who were strangled and burned and slaughtered for their Judaism. And in their memory, we pledge tzedakah, good deeds to repair the world. We ask that their bravery and dedication and sacrifice be reflected in our own lives. We must bear witness. We must never be silent. We are the eyes that remember. We are the voice that cries out. That is why we must be vigilant today. We must be vigilant in denouncing anti-Semitism in all forms. On the right, we must denounce anti-Semitism that camouflages as radical strains of populism and patriotism. On the left, we must denounce anti-Semitism that masquerades as cultural wokeness. We must denounce those who refuse to denounce intolerance. And we must denounce anti-Semitism and intolerance in every form, in every place, at political rallies, on college campuses, on social media. Lastly, and perhaps most importantly, as we say in a prayer for Shabbat, we must rededicate ourselves to forge a common bond between all religions and races, to banish all hatred and bigotry, and to safeguard the ideals that are the pride and glory of our country. We have pledged to never forget, yet we still must be reminded. As we were taught as children, and now a generation later as we teach our own children, this is how we repair the world. Shalom.
Thank you everyone for sharing your stories and those beautiful songs with us. To remember those who we have lost and who will forever be in our hearts, Cantor Neil Newman will sing a special rendition of the prayer El Malai Rachamim, followed by Rabbi Shefrin, who will recite the mourner's Kaddish. sanctification of God's name, and the men, women, and children who were slaughtered, burned, and killed in the Holocaust. In their memory we pray. May our lives reflect the measure of their bravery, dedication, and purity of soul. May their souls be bound up in the bond of life. May they be remembered with honor, and may they rest in peace in your right hand forever. Amen. In Jewish tradition, there is an offering made in praise of God. We call it the Mourner's Kaddish, Kaddish Yatom. If you would like to say it along, I invite you to do so. And if you are able, I invite you to please rise in memory of all the souls that were taken from us. Yit gadal v'yit gadash shemei rabah ve'alma divrach hirutei v'yamlich malchutei v'chayechon uv'yomechon uv'chaye d'chol beit Yisrael v'agala uv'izman kariv v'imru amen. Yehei Shmei Rabba Mevorach Le'olam Ulomei Omaya. Yit Barach V'yit Tabach V'yit Pa'ar V'yit Romam V'yit Naseh. V'yit Adar V'yit Aleh V'yit Halal Shmei Dekutsha B'richu. Le'ela Min Kol Berchata V'shirata. Tush Bechata V'nechemata. Damiran Be'alma V'imru Amen. 
יהי שלם על רב אמין שמיא, וחיים עלינו ועל כל ישראל, ואמרו אמן. עושה שלום במרומיו, הוא יעשה שלום עלינו ועל כל ישראל ועל כל יושבי תבל, ואמרו אמן. May the one who brings peace and comfort from the heavens bring peace and comfort to all who remember, to all who mourn, to all who know, and will never forget. Amen. Now let us please recite the Hands Against Hate Pledge with the children from Temple Emmanuel Religious School as we promise to help make our community a safer, and more peaceful place filled with love. I pledge. I pledge. To stand up and resist. To stand up and resist. Hate, bigotry, and bullying. Hate, bigotry, and bullying. I will not stay silent. I will not stay silent. In the face of intolerance. In the face of intolerance. I will work with my neighbors. I will work with my neighbors. To create kinder. To create kinder. Safer, safer, and more inclusive communities, and more inclusive communities for all. For all. Thank you once again for joining us on this very special International Holocaust Remembrance Day commemoration, and a special thank you to all who helped bring this program to our community today. Stay safe, stay healthy, and shalom.